Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from York Juggler 66 Hour of the Truth. Today again, once again, in collaboration with my brother Tom Fress from Inquisition Update over there in the United States of America. We come here together to do the, I think it is seventh session of the special series within a series of the special study within a study, exploding the Israel deception within that study of the Antichrist and how reformers not only viewed the Antichrist, but there's one very important point that we didn't put our finger on too hard yet, but that is going to be in the future, that with this we see through the deception that is taught in the world that the second beast of Revelation 13 is the United States of America is wrong. And we can prove that, that even um, reformers who lived hundreds of years ago already knew that the first beast of Revelation chapter 13, the beast coming out of the sea, is pagan Rome, and the second beast coming out of the earth is papal Rome, after quote-unquote Rome fell, was divided into ten nations, and papal Rome took over the little horn that grew out of ten horns. That is a system that we are still living in today. And those are all studies to come about what time do we have to reckon on the 1260 day year prophecy or time times and a half of uh, or dividing of time. That's all things to come in another point. But here we are with a list given on this um, video that we have gone through the last few broadcasts already showing you what reformers before the reformation officially start thought of the papacy and of the beast number one and the beast number two and the harlot in revelation chapter 17 so we are going through um revelation 13 and 17 in that regard we have then seen and are still seeing what reformers did view during the reformational times and we are going to see also what people or reformers saw after the reformational times and of course we know that in the times we live today there are almost no reformers who have any historicist view because they are all uh, embalmed let's say by futurism and these teachings or these videos are there for you to tell you and to show you in proof in history how important the historicist view is and that when you have a historicist view that is built on the 1611 King James Bible you will not be betrayed and that is something Jesus Christ and Paul warned about in the New Testament that take heed that no man deceives you man can only deceive you if you do not have the Word of God the Bible in this English case the 1611 King James Bible Therefore, Tom and I will go today again into this little table that we've shown already. And the next reformer that we are speaking of, and this is probably going to take the whole hour today, is Thomas Cranmer. Tom spoke of him last week, didn't come to the name that was, and he said that there was a reformer who held his fist into the fire when he was burning at the stake. And of course, after the session we did, I looked it up and there's a lot of interesting information on Thomas Cranmer that we are going through today. We, as I said, me and Tom Fress from Inquisition Update, who I warmly welcome to the broadcast. Hello, Brother Tom. Hello, Yerk. It's so blessed to be here and uh, continue our study and, uh, and, and to find out what the saints of God before us believed. That's what this is all about. And now we've made a study of this for several days. We've picked out certain individuals of history who were reformers, those who believed who the Antichrist was, was the papacy. And uh, uh, the first beast of Revelation chapter 13 was old pagan Rome, that power which was in control when Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. And then the second beast uh, is the papacy. And that's what the saints of God before us believed. Now, who in their right minds would discredit 
the saints of Almighty God throughout history and what they believed. I want to begin by asking the listeners a question. Seeing that uh, what is taught in all the churches today is futurism, that belief that Daniel's 70th week has never been fulfilled and is going to be fulfilled in the future by a single individual just before Christ returns. He will deceive the whole world and uh, he will fulfill the 70th week of Daniel. This Antichrist will fulfill the 70th week of Daniel in the future, just before Christ returns. Now, that's what's taught in all the churches. You can't hardly find a church anywhere in the world that doesn't teach this or some form of it. Now, I got the question I have for the listeners is, after listening to two or three weeks full of discussion about the saints of God throughout history and what they believed, I, the question is, were they futurists or historicists? Obviously, they were historicists. How do you know? Because they knew who the Antichrist was. That's how you know when you're speaking to someone if he's historicist in his interpretation of Bible prophecy or if he's futurist in his interpretation of Bible prophecy. A historicist always can tell you who the Antichrist is. A futurist can never tell you who the Antichrist is unless he's speculating. He's not sure of himself. That much you can always determine of a futurist. He is not sure of himself. He may have opinions. He may have surmises. He may have a guess, but he's speculating. And everything he says will indicate to you that he's speculating about who the Antichrist is. A, a historicist won't bat an eye. If you ask a historicist who the Antichrist is, he will, within an instant, tell you the papacy. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist of Scripture, history, and prophecy. You see how easy that flows off my tongue? Because I've believed it, and I've taught it for decades. Why? Because I am, like the people that we've been studying, the saints of God throughout the centuries, I believe the same thing that they believe. I believe that the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by Jesus, Messiah the Prince, the Prince that shall come of Daniel's prophecy. The 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled by none other than Jesus Christ and his seven-year ministry upon the earth. That seven-year ministry was the 70th week of Daniel. It's finished. And the New Testament is the unimpeachable historical account of everything that took place during Christ's 70th prophetic week. And it is impeachable. No one can challenge the evidence that is given in plain English throughout the New, Test New Testament, proving proof positive the most infallible, the most detailed written record of the 70th week of Daniel. That's what is the New Testament, okay? Daniel prophesied a thing called the 70 weeks of Daniel. And in that 70th and final week, Messiah the Prince would cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease. He would confirm the covenant that God made with Abraham, okay? He would redeem us of our sins. He would put an end of sin, make reconciliation for iniquity. He did all of those things, and they are accounted for item by item by at least three witnesses throughout the entire New Testament. That's the very purpose for the writing of the New Testament, to end any potential dispute about when the 70th week of Daniel was fulfilled. You cannot read the New Testament and not conclude that Jesus fulfilled the 70th week of Daniel, just like Daniel prophesied.
Okay? And that's what the saints of Almighty God have believed all throughout the Christian era for 2,000 years. Jesus was the fulfillment of the 70th week of Daniel. Now, Paul said Messiah cannot come, that is, Messiah cannot return until that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition that causeth all, small and great, to receive a mark in the right hand of their forehead. Okay? He will think to change times and laws. Okay? He'd be the enemy of Christ. He is the Antichrist, and Jesus cannot and will not return until that man of sin is revealed. And guess what? Just exactly like Daniel prophesied, just exactly like Paul prophesied, just exactly like John the Revelator prophesied, Antichrist was fulfilled when the old pagan Roman Empire, the first beast, morphed into the second beast, the holy Roman Empire under the papacy. You've been taught by your godless schools that the Roman Empire has fallen. That is not true. It never fail, fell. The power of the Caesars were simply transferred to the popes when the Roman Empire embraced, as it were, Christianity. It went from a pagan Roman Empire to a papal Roman Empire. And God help us never to call it a Christian empire. That's blasphemy. You can't equate Roman Catholicism or the papacy or anything having to do with Rome with Christ and his kingdom. They are antithesis. They are mutually exclusive events. You have the kingdom of Christ on one hand. You have the kingdom of Antichrist in Rome on the other hand. Don't ever call Roman Catholicism Christianity because you've blasphemed the name of Christ when you do. All right, so you've seen with your own eyes as we've continued this study for several weeks that the saints of God throughout history believed, number one, the first beast was the old pagan Roman Empire. The second beast of Revelation chapter 13 was the papal Roman Empire, and the papacy was revealed as the Antichrist long, long ago. And that's why historicists believe the papacy is the Antichrist. And you can't convince them anything other than that. They know too much. They have too much proof. There's too much history. There's too much scripture. There's too much common sense to teach anything other than the truth. The papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. Just as Jesus is, was, and always will be the Messiah, the Prince, the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. And they have been opposed to one another since the very beginning. Okay? Now, you have to ask yourself, why is this not taught in the churches? It's the only thing that makes sense. Why are the churches not telling you the truth? The answer is simple. They want you to reunite with the Roman Catholic Church. They want you to exonerate the papacy. They don't want you to believe that the Roman Catholic papacy is the Antichrist. They want you to believe the Roman Catholic Church is a Christian church. They want you to blaspheme the name of Christ and accept Roman Catholicism as the head of Christianity in this world. Now, you can't deceive or be deceived any more than that. Do you understand what I'm saying? This whole ecumenical movement is an all-out war against Christ, and they're teaching it in all the churches. Without exception, they're teaching this in all the churches. There's no church that does not teach this abomination. So what's the answer? You get out of the churches. Satan has ascended to the throne of Almighty God in the churches, just like he swore to do in Isaiah chapter 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And where would he presume to do that? 
Well, to sit as head of the largest so-called blasphemous Christian church in the world, the Roman Catholic Church, and to be the head of all Christian Christianity. And, and Tom, not he can't, only that, he can't do it. Sorry, he can't do it in heaven because he's thrown out of heaven. Well, that's he can right, only, that's right. He can only do it on earth. That's right. He can only do it on earth. It's an earthly kingdom, not a heavenly one. It's an earthly kingdom. Okay. And now that he has ascended to the, the, the largest throne in all of quote unquote Christianity, God forgive me. He's got an emissary in every one of the so-called Protestant and evangelical churches. He's your pastor. Look at him. You love him. You love his wife, the big hair, the wonderful smiles on their faces, the beautiful music, the, 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 the fancy suits, the fancy cars and airplanes. Oh, we just love and we, we lavish them with our affection. We lavish them with our support. We lavish them with our financial support. But they're demons. They're teaching us diabolical lies, futurist lies. They deny who the Antichrist is because they are his servants. They are his servants, not Christ's servants. Okay? It's a bitter pill to swallow, isn't it? All right, now we're going to talk about Thomas Cranmer. In a second. In a minute. Yeah, in a minute. Because well, one of the great one of the great martyrs of Jesus. And we're because, going to talk about go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Drew. because I just came up with something else that I wanted to talk about for a moment, Tom, and I think this is very important that you elaborate a little bit on it. Um, as you see here, I put my the papacy is the Antichrist channel uh, in the picture and the playlist. Um, of Simon Peter versus Simon Magus. Now, Simon Peter versus Simon Magus is a book by Ernest L. Martin that you read on First Amendment Radio. And I read the study here with uh, Brett Norman and Michael from Germany some years ago. And um, it is so important just at least for a moment now to speak about that because you said uh, to equate Roman Catholicism with Christianity is a blasphemy. And is, it uh, is. is, yeah, of course it is. But, but you said that. Now we're going to give the people the reason why it is. The problem is that the teaching in this world, the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church itself, is that she comes forth out of the apostles, that Peter was the chief apostle. Peter and Paul, and that's when you, what you understand when you read books like um, The Two Babylons from Alexander Hislop and all that. Um, Peter and Paul have replaced um, Romus and uh, Remulus, or what are the Remus and Romulus, the, the two quote unquote wolves, the founders of Rome, have been replaced by uh, Peter and Paul. That's the story of the Roman Catholic Church. The story of the Roman Catholic Church is that she comes forth out of the apostles. Yeah? And that is the problem why everybody equates Roman Catholicism with Christianity. Because what comes out of, let alone Jesus Christ, of course, because it's called, Christ, called Christianity because of Jesus Christ, what comes out of Jesus Christ is his apostles, is Peter, is Paul, that is Christianity, but that had never anything to do with the real foundation of the Roman Catholic Church. And therefore it is interesting not only to read this book from Ernest L. Martin, but here, I'm going to read a little quote from that, and I think that's quite appropriate in this reading today, Tom, so um, excuse me for just reading a little part of it. It says here, right from the very beginning, Satan had his counterfeit Messiah operating right in the true Messiah's backyard. His name was Simon Magus, or Simon the Sorcerer, and this man, and not Simon Peter the Apostle, went on to found the universal Roman quote-unquote church. His career was the history of Roman Catholicism in miniature. For a long time he bewitched the people with his false miracles. Since the year 800 AD, Rome has bewitched the world with her false miracles of transubstantiation. Simon believed and was baptized. Outwardly, 
he was a Christian, but his belief was only superficial and he was still a pagan at heart. He coveted the apostolic office and saw the opportunity of using Christianity, the true Christianity, to make money, a business corporation masquerading as the Church of Christ. From Simon Magus we get the word simony, which means to buy a religious office with money. After his encounter with St. Peter, this magician went to Rome and by tricks and false miracles established a quote-unquote Christian church in that city. This man can truly be considered as the first of the age-long dynasty of popes, many coming in Christ's name and deceiving many. I think that is enough and I really want you Tom to elaborate a little bit on that because when you say Roman Catholicism just abuses the name Christianity. Here are the real roots of Roman Catholicism, not the roots they taught or they teach to the world, because they teach to the world, oh, we come from Peter, we come from Paul, we come from Jesus Christ directly. No, they do not. That is a church that split already in Rome in the time. And it is neither my place nor my idea to really go deep into that, but I think, Tom, that you should at least give it a few minutes before we continue with this wonderful reformer and martyr, um, John Letterman. <laughs> Sorry, just, just lost his name. Please, Tom, please, please go on to yeah, say a little bit of, uh, about what, what I just said and... Uh, what are your thoughts about that? And I think it is so important to make sure to the people that when you go back to the roots of the founding of a religion, the true roots, you see that universalism or Catholicism as it is called today was not founded on any biblical dogma or any biblical persons like Peter and Paul. Please, Tom. Yes, well, the Roman Catholic Church has a founder, and the Bible reveals who that founder is, and history confirms. Uh, Simon Peter had been a sorcerer. He had bewitched the people of Samaria. They thought he was the great power of God. The scriptures tell us this, Romans, or, uh, uh, Acts chapter 8, if I'm not mistaken, or 12, I can't remember for sure. But uh, Acts chapter eight, he, Tom. Okay, and he uh, he saw the apostles laying on hands and imparting the Holy Spirit to people. And Simon Magus thought that was a really cool magic trick, and he wanted to buy it. He wanted to be able to lay his hands on people and impart to them the Holy Spirit, like the apostles did. In other words, he wanted to buy an apostleship. Now, is that what God does? He sells ecclesiastical offices for money? No. As a matter of fact, Simon Magus approached Peter about this. He'd like to buy this magic trick for money. And guess what Peter told him? He said, your money perish with you. Okay, now I got in trouble for this the other day, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the same word. Think Clear, carefully what Peter told Simon Magus when Simon Magus, Simon the sorcerer, sought to buy an apostleship. He said, you have neither part nor lot with us. In other words, we cast lots to see who was going to be the apostles. You weren't there. You cannot be an apostle. And if you attempt to buy this apostleship, well, then you and your money perish together. That's what Simon, that's what Simon Peter told to his face, Simon Magus. You and your money perish together. Now in Iowa, we would say, Simon Magus, you and your money can go straight to hell. And that's exactly what Peter told Simon Magus. 
Okay. He didn't tell him that in Iowa speak. He told him that, but he told him the same thing. Your money perish with you. Where do we perish? In the grave and in hell. Okay? First the grave and then hell. Listen again what Peter told Simon Magus. Your money perish with you. In other words, you and your money can go straight to hell where you belong. He said, you are of a bondage of, of, of bitterness. Okay? Bitterness means false doctrine. Okay? And a bond of iniquity, it says. In other words, you are bound to iniquity. You're not free. You are bound to iniquity. What is that? That is the spirit of Antichrist. You see, there's no repentance for Satan, and there's no repentance for his vicar on earth. You are of a gall of bitterness, that is false doctrine, and a, a bond of iniquity. In other words, you are chained with chains around your hands and your feet. You are bound to iniquity. In other words, you are anti-Christ, and in you there is no repentance nor forgiveness. Now, does anybody think that I've oversold this? Does anybody think that I have overstated this? Here you have, right in God's own word, the first real Antichrist and the founder of the Roman Catholic Church, a false apostle, just like the betrayer Judas Iscariot. You can call him the Judas priest, Simon the sorcerer, not Simon, not, not, not Simon Peter, Simon the sorcerer. And he went to Rome and he founded a religion, a universal religion. And he used the same, the self-same sorcery that he used in Samaria to bewitch the people. And the people, just like they did in Samaria, the Romans thought him to be the great power of God on earth. And when you see a papacy and you call him a Christian, it's the same as calling Simon Magus a Christian. You have blasphemed the name of Christ. You are a blasphemer. So stop calling the Roman Catholic Church a Christian church. It is the church of, Sa of Satan. It is the church of Antichrist. It is the church of Simon Magus in Acts chapter 8. You can't get it wrong. God gave us the instruction we need to know what the Roman Catholic Church is. And uh, I don't... I don't think I can impress it upon the listeners firmly enough. Don't ever call the Roman Catholic Church a Christian church. Don't ever call a Roman Catholic a Christian. Don't ever call the Pope the leader of the Christian world because you have offended the name of God. It's a serious crime. It's a serious crime. And by your own mouth, you lead yourself astray. You lead yourself away from the truth, not toward the truth. The Roman Catholic Church is the synagogue of Satan. It is the church that Simon Magus built. And what characterizes the Roman Catholic Church throughout its entire history is the very thing that marked Simon Magus as an antichrist. He tried to buy an apostleship. And throughout the history of the Roman Catholic Church, the popes who claim to be successors of the apostle Peter, in other words, apostles themselves, they buy their office as papacy. It's the Church of Simony. All the bishops do it. All the archbishops do it. All the cardinals do it. All the popes do it. 
They even fight wars in order to achieve ecclesiastical office. There's no other church in the whole world that has demonstrated itself proof positive to be a simoniacal church, a church of Simon Magus, where simony is the name of the game. Buying ecclesiastical office, buying ecclesiastical power, buying ecclesiastical privilege with money. More proof that you cannot deny, that you cannot gainsay, that you cannot argue with. The Roman Catholic Church has proven itself over and over and over for the last 2,000 years to be exactly what the Protestant reformers said it was, the synagogue of Satan, the church of Antichrist, the persecutor of the saints of God, the counterfeit Christ on the earth, an earthly kingdom as opposed to a heavenly kingdom. Now, what did Thomas Cramer think of the Roman Catholic Church? He was a Roman Catholic monk, an archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church in England. And he began to teach Protestant doctrine. Why? Because he had read the scriptures in his own language and he knew what the Bible was telling about the papacy and about the Roman Catholic Church. And he was all, all informed for the first time in his life the salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. And there's no need for popes. There's no need for priests because Daniel prophesied that Jesus, the great high priest of Christianity, caused all sacrifices and oblations to cease when he became the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. The one Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the whole world. So there's no need for priests. That puts the entire ecclesiastical uh, part of the Roman Catholic Church in the soup line. No more priests. No more sacrifices. Okay? If there's no more sacrifice, there's no need for a priest. And that, for, that means there's no need for a pope, because we have Jesus, the supreme sacrifice, the great high priest of Christianity. So what role does the Pope play but a deceiver? And grace is free. It's a gift of God. Why do we need sacraments? Why do we need to participate in the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church? Why do we need to participate in a mass, which is nothing but a sacrifice, when Jesus caused the sacrifice and oblations to cease? Why do we need an elaborate, overly expensive and magnificent magnificent church when we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. You see what Jesus did to the Roman Catholic Church? He dropped it to its very foundations with a free salvation. But we've got one of Roman Catholic's minions standing behind every pulpit in this church, in this, in this country. And they would have you believe that the papacy is not the Antichrist, but a single individual in the future. What did Thomas Cranmer believe? He believed everything that the Protestant reformers believed. He believed everything that the saints of God, all the way back to the first, second, first century church under Paul's ministry, the Thessalonians knew that that power that replaced the Caesars would be the Antichrist. They knew the papacy replaced the Caesars. There was no doubt in their minds. Thomas Cranmer believed the papacy was the Antichrist. Thomas Cranmer believed that the Roman the, that the Roman Empire under the Caesars was the first beast. The papal empire, the papal Roman Empire, was the second beast. He believed what every other saint of God believed for the last two thousand years. And I'm going to ask you again. I have to ask you again. Why don't you believe this? Why don't you believe what the saints of God have believed all the way back to the first, first century church? Somebody's lying to you. Somebody is teaching you carefully devised fables. And you must repent. You've now heard the truth. And the responsibility lies upon you to correct what you believe. Back to you, Yerk. Now let's go into 
Thomas Cranmer, 1582, as is stated here in the timeline. He believed the Antichrist was the papacy. He believed the little horn coming out of the ten horns is the papacy. He believed the man of sin is the papacy. He believed in Revelation chapter 17, the harlot speaking about is the papacy. And he believed in Revelation chapter 17, mystery Babylon the Great is the papacy. Now, as with all the other reformers, I went already to show you Wikipedia pages. As I said in the very first part of these, I said Wikipedia is an interesting source of information. If you take it with a grain of salt, it needs to be taken with. Everybody can write on Wikipedia if they are approved by the hierarchy. And in the end, that hierarchy that approves Wikipedia editors is nothing else but the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. Because the Roman Catholic Church controls all media. And that is written in the papal encyclical from 1958, Miranda Prosus, and in the second encyclical in this regard, Inter Mirifica from 1963. In these encyclicals, it is stated that it is the birthright of the Roman Catholic Church to own all media devices, speaking of newspapers, television, radio, movies, whatever you had at that time. And of, and course, the internet. Anything, and of course, anything that comes out of that is being developed later on, like today, social media and the internet, of course, not to forget. And Wikipedia is part of the Internet. Now, now you can say Tom and Jörg are also part of the Internet. No, we are not part of the Internet. We just use the Internet to publish our studies. That's a different thing. But Wikipedia is actually controlled. So the point is Wikipedia only tells you what they want you to know. But there are many links put in here that can sometimes lead you on an interesting way to study. Just when you click at, for example, here, the Book of Common Prayer, and you can learn about what the Book of Common Prayer is. And there are so many links, as you see on this side, they are all in blue. So you see every time you click on something here in blue, it is a um, link that is being used. And just today I heard, by the way, that Erasmus' writings, uh, speaking of the Textus Receptus on which the New Testament uh, is based, um, that his writings were on the list of forbidden books in the papacy a few hundred years ago. And um, that's interesting, huh? because Erasmus is the one who delivered the texts for the New Testament as we know it today. And Erasmus is also mentioned here. Uh, you can see, here's his name, Erasmus. Now, the point is that with these links here with it, you get so much information, you get abundant of information that sometimes you are divulged in this information. You mean you're buried under all this information. You can't get, you can't suck it all up. You can't study all of that. So you have to make um, choices. And the choices that you make should be the choices as they did in, um, uh, where was it, uh, Antioch in the Bible, in uh, chapter 17, verse 11, where it says that those uh, Jews were better than those in Thessalonica because they really checked everything in the world if it held up against the Bible. And that's what you also should do. So when your research that you are doing via Wikipedia holds on to the Bible, then it is righteous. And if it doesn't hold on, then it is a lie. And there's a lot of lie in this, and I know that. But we are still using this because it is easy, accessible for everybody, but everybody is responsible for the way that he does his own research. We can't do it all for you. You have to do it for yourself. Because the truth that Tom tells you, or the truth that I tell you, is of no importance to you. It is only the truth that you find in the Bible. But here and there, Maybe our words can help you understand the words of the Bible a little better, or the history of the Bible a little better. That's why we call ourselves historicists. So, um, not to make this too long, you see this is a very long article on Latimer. 
and I'm not going into all this, but I, uh, uh, Cranmer, sorry, Thomas Cranmer, um, I prepared another article, or prepared, I found another article which is very interesting and tells us about the unlawful execution of Thomas Cranmer, because that's exactly the point that Tom made in the last broadcast when he spoke about, yeah, I know there was a reformer and he couldn't come to the name who it was, who held his fist that wrote recantational papers in the fire to be burned first when he was burned on the stake. And this is a um, woodcut that you can see out of that time um, that is the burning of uh, Thomas Cranmer, as you can see here, in, uh, at Oxford, of all places, where he was burned. Um, this is one picture. I also uh, looked out for another picture of Thomas Cranmer, like example for this, because you maybe don't know that, but in uh, good old England, in 1989, you could buy post stamps commemorating the fifth, 500th uh, anniversary of the burning of Thomas Cranmer on the stake. Here you can see that. Huh? That is in England, you could buy that some, well, today, 1989, some a little bit more than 30 years ago. And also another picture that I used is uh, Ridley and Latimer and Cranmer all together. You have Ridley here, you had Cranmer here, and you have uh, Latimer here. And we spoke about Ridley and Latimer, who were burned at the stake, and what they were saying when they were burned on the stake. They were all three just um, martyrs for Jesus Christ. Yeah. So these are the pictures, and now we go into the text that I uh, found. And of course, the text is provided as a link in the description box of this video. I'm going to read the main text. And whenever Tom feels that he wants to make a comment, he is interrupting me and then uh, commenting on it. The unlawful execution of Thomas Cranmer on the 21st of March, 1556. On this day in history, 21st of March, 1556, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer was burned at the stake in Oxford. His crimes, heresy and treason. Okay, and I'd like to make comments now. I want you to remember, first of all, that England fought three civil wars uh, to get control of England, either for the Pope or away from the Pope. Okay, England was a battleground between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. It was a battleground between Christ and Antichrist. Okay, and it was a hard-fought battle. Ro uh, England was ripped to shreds in three different civil wars. The papacy trying to get control of, of England and make it Roman Catholic. And the Protestants, the, the saints of Almighty God, resisting and protesting the Antichrist and fighting back and trying to make England Protestant or Christian, biblical Christianity. And Thomas Cranmer was the Archbishop of England, a Roman Catholic. But he began to believe and teach Protestant doctrine. And he found himself running afoul of the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, anyone who teaches contrary to the Roman Catholic Church is adjudged by the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church of being a heretic. Okay. In the Roman Catholic Church, if you are adjudged of being a heretic by the Roman Catholic Church, you are a criminal. It is, it is a capital offense. It requires the death of the heretic. Anyone who teaches contrary to the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, the official dogma of the Roman Catholic Church, Roman Catholic doctrine, and if you are found to be a heretic for doing so, you are condemned to die. And once you're determined by the Roman Catholic Church to be a heretic, you are excommunicated from the church. That means you are no longer Roman Catholic, and therefore you are outside the Roman Catholic Church and outside the benefits of the Roman Catholic Church, which means 
heaven is shut up against you. And you're an outlaw in this world, Tom. That's right. You become an outlaw of the church. And then I'll talk about the second charge against Cranmer, which is treason. Okay? Treason is an offense committed against the civil power. Okay? You become a traitor or a treason if you are found to be an enemy of the state. In this case, Thomas Cranmer was determined to be an enemy of the government of England. And you want to, you you would ask the question, well, why? What did he do against the government of England? He started preaching Protestantism in a Roman Catholic country. So he was ipso facto excommunicated from the church, and as such, he instantly became a traitor to the state because the tr the state in a Roman Catholic country, the state is the vassal of the Pope. Okay, in Roman Catholicism, not Christianity, in anti-Christianity, the papacy is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the counterfeit Christ, and he expects to be obeyed as if he were Christ on earth. Okay, the papacy regards itself as sweet Christ on earth. And the papacy reigns over the kings of the earth. And if you don't think that's true, then you think the Bible is a liar, because the Bible plainly tells you about that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. That great city mentioned in the Bible is Vatican City. It reigns over the kings of the earth. You say, well, Tom, it doesn't reign over the government of the United States. Well, you just keep thinking that. And you will be deceived, okay? You'll find yourself a servant of the Antichrist. The Bible doesn't lie. The Bible is explicit. That great city which reigns over the kings of the earth is the smallest city on the planet. It's called Vatican City. It's 108 acres. About 3,000 people work and live there. And it is the seat of the man of sin in Rome. It is the very headquarters of Satan's vicar in Rome. And he rules over the kings of the earth. Okay? Satan once offered that office to Jesus, remember, in his temptation immediately after he was baptized? He said, if you'll just get down on the ground and worship me, I'll make you head of every government. See all the kingdoms of this earth and all of them and the, the glory of them all. To them I will give you if you'll just bow down and worship me. Jesus walked away, didn't he? But do you suppose Satan never offered that office to someone else? See all the, listen carefully, you, the, you that say that the, that the Vatican does not have any control over the government of the United States, to you I'm speaking right now. Do you believe that Satan didn't offer that same offer to, offer to, uh, offer to someone else and say, see all the kingdoms of the world, including the United States, and the glory of them all, and the power of them all, and the affluence of them all, to you I will give them if you'll just bow down and worship me. Now, you know Jesus didn't bow down and worship him, but do you suppose the papacy did? I'm telling you, that is precisely what happened. The papacy has made a deal with the devil. Even Martin Luther said publicly and in writing, the papacy is simply the mask behind which Satan resides. He, always, he found out eventually that the Roman Catholic Church was Satan's church. Do you think Martin Luther would dare call it Christianity? Not without blaspheming Christ, he wouldn't. So that's where the, the Antichrist has resided ever since, throughout the entire Christian era. And those who worship Jesus and him only 
before the Protestant Reformation and before the, the formation of the papacy, they prayed against the papacy, knowing that it would be that power that replaced the Caesars. So who is that? The papacy. God's people have always known who the Antichrist is. God's people have always prayed against him. God's people have always taught against him. God's people have always positively identified him so that no one can make a mistake, just like I'm doing, just like Yerk's doing. The saints of Almighty God have always and forever known who the Antichrist is. And we pray against him, we preach against him, we teach against him, and we warn God's people not to be deceived by him. And uh, we're historicist in our understanding. And we believe futurism is the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. And that's what's being taught in all of our churches. Now, Thomas Cranmer was a Roman Catholic archbishop who had been learning from the Scriptures. He began to preach and teach biblical Christianity. And he found himself running afoul of the synagogue of Satan, the papal antichrist, and all of his minions, even in the government of England. He was declared to be a heretic. He was excommunicated from the Roman Catholic Church. And he became an enemy of the state. And the Roman Catholic Church gave him over to the state to be tortured by fire. That's what heresy and treason are, the two charges placed against uh, Thomas Cranmer and all the great saints of God throughout history. Heresy and treason. Heresy because he taught contrary to the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Treason because he taught contrary to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. And the state made him a traitor. Union of church and state, that's what it was. That's why our Constitution, in, in a feeble attempt to separate church and state, that's what it was designed to do, to separate this country from the power of the popes, but to no avail. The United States is as much a vassal of the papacy as England ever was. Back to you, Yerk. Yeah, we are going into this article, and let's see how far we are going to read. Today, not so far, I guess, but uh, there are more meetings, more studies to come. You can read the full details, the author continues, of Thomas Cranmer's life and downfall in my two-part series, The Life of Archbishop Thomas Cranmer and the Execution of Thomas Cranmer. But here, and this is what this website is about, this page is about, here is a brief account of Cranmer's last days. Thomas Cranmer was found guilty of treason and condemned to death on the 13th of November 1553 and imprisoned in Bocado Prison at Oxford with Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley, who we spoke about last week, as you'll remember. All three men were tried for heresy on the 12th of September 1555 and Ridley and Latimer, who were found guilty at the trial, were burned at the stake on the 16th of October 1555 in Oxford. Cranmer, as Archbishop, had to wait for a decision from Rome as to the verdict. In December 1555, Rome sent its decision. He lost his office of Archbishop and permission was given for secular authorities to rule on Cranmer's fate. Okay, can I make a comment now? Sure, I, don't want the I don't want the listeners to miss this. Nothing could be done about Archbishop Cranmer until the Pope made a decision. So the God of Thomas Cranmer was the Pope. And the Pope, when he made his decision, gave power to the state to execute him. Now, for those who before were arguing that the papacy doesn't have control of the government, I give you a perfect historical record of the papacy having just that same authority in 1555 over the government of England. Nothing could be done about the heretic 
and the traitor, Thomas Cranmer, until the Pope, who reigns over the kings of the earth, made his official decision and then authorized the government of England to execute Thomas Cranmer by burning fire. Now, if you can't believe and won't believe that the government has, or that the Vatican has that much authority over the government of the United States, you cannot deny that in 1555, the papacy did have that power over the government of England. You cannot deny it. And this is the one thing that have, the people that I talk to have so much trouble wrapping their brain around. But it's backed up in scripture. That city, that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth is none other than Vatican City. And we have multiple, uh, that's, that's a too weak of a word. We have multitudes of examples of the papacy using that power over the kings of the earth. Back to you, Yerk. Okay, I should have put that picture in there earlier. In December 1555, just the sentence that Tom elaborated about, Rome sent its decision. Rome has decided. The papacy, the Antichrist, has decided. That Cranmer lost his office of archbishop and permission was given Permission was given for the secular authorities to rule on Cranmer's fate. In an effort to save himself, Cranmer made four recantations in January and February 1556. In these recantations, he submitted himself to his monarch, Mary I, Bloody Mary, and recognized the Pope as head of the church. However, Edmund Bonner, Bishop of London, was not convinced by Cranmer's recantation. So his priesthood was taken away and it was decided that he would be executed for heresy on the 7th of March. A desperate Cranmer then made a fifth recantation in which he stated that he fully accepted Catholic theology and that there was no salvation to be found outside of the Catholic Church. He repudiated his Protestant theology and affirmed that he was returning to the Catholic Church. He took part in the Mass and asked for sacramental absolution. Now, this should be, or this should have been the end of it. Cranmer had fully recanted. He had done what Mary I wanted and in a very public way. He should have been absolved, but although his execution was postponed temporarily by Mary I, then set a date for it, 21st of March, 1556. His recantations were for nothing. I personally think, Tom, that this is a wonderful moment to stop this uh, reading to, for today. We will go back into this article if you want it and if the listeners want it next week. But I think this last sentence that we just read is very interesting because your, your ministry is called Inquisition Update. It's from the Inquisition. And we know from the history of the Inquisition that even when you were brought before the judges of the inquisitorial um, uh, um, court. Uh, court, thanks, yes. yeah, that, that word just slipped by my tongue, mm -hmm. the Inquisitional Court, and you recanted of every Protestant word, belief, act you ever did. Yep. They still killed you. They killed you. They killed you for the purpose of preventing you from recanting your recantation. And this with Thomas Cranmer is another example that the Inquisition was running high in 1555 in England, under the reign of Mary I, who you know as Bloody Mary. And the sentence that I just read is just a confirmation of that. Yeah. So I would really mu very much like to leave it here and postpone the rest for another meeting 
next session, Tom, next week, if that's okay with you. And then I would, of course, love for you to have the closing remarks on today's study. Certainly, and I appreciate the opportunity because I have something special to tell the listeners. God forewarned us of these days. He foresaw those like Thomas Cranmer, and there were many who recanted their Protestant and their biblical beliefs and teachings to spare their own lives. And therefore, God made sure that it was in his word. Fear not them who can destroy the body. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Thomas Cranmer feared those who were going to destroy his body, and he recanted until he recanted of his recantation and swore that when they put him in the flames of the of, of the inquisitorial fire, that the first thing that would burn is the right hand of him, of, 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 of his right hand that signed his original recantations. Let this wicked right hand first perish in the fire. He learned to fear the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. And he feared no longer those who could destroy the body only. I'll see you next time.